I totally, I totally yeah. understand yeah. that. Yeah, right. Yeah, because yeah. 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 you <laughs> tend, you tend to think. You're right. Oh, well, that people. Yeah. Uh -huh. oh, that's all right. Yeah, just, we, yeah, we'll we'll be with you in a minute. You, can, you know, you tend to think that. Uh, you know, when I did my one man play, mm -hmm. the reason I had a a it's actually a Jewish man that directed and stuff. Mm -hmm. I wanted someone that, that knew nothing about Pentecost or right. anything else, so that I could relate that. Oh, there. See, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, totally because you sense. tend you tend to think everybody understands what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. You can't find the camera. Are we on? Yes, you're on. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a little blurry today. I don't know Okay, why. blurry. Welcome. Well, that's just may us. But, you know, we are a little fuzzy sometimes. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, she, she's wiping the lens <laughs> while y'all are trying to watch. Okay, there you go. Well, as uh, Hedda Muscat said one time when we ran into her at the Rainbow and said, I watch every Sunday, and I like it because you're not spiritual. Yes. Well, we're li definitely living up to the reputation. Yes, yes. <laughs> Exceeding our limitations on That's the attitude right. that we give. <laughs> we want to welcome you to the gospel according to Kennison. And I want to emphasize that. <laughs> according <laughs> to Bill Kennison. Uh, it, from beautiful, sunny Southern California. I'm telling you, this is this is God's country out here. I don't know what, I don't know what, who runs all the other countries. <laughs> This is definitely God's country out here. This is just beautiful. Almost every Sunday morning, it is just beautiful. And I'm here with the beautiful Susie Phillips. And uh, sometimes we get into a conversation and we don't want to finish it. And it's time to go on the air. So we just keep on going. So you get to <laughs> jump right in of, of what we're doing. Uh, another thing I'd like to say is, is that we're, uh, we're having people that are watching us and, and uh, they want... They want prayer for them or someone else. If you, uh, uh, if you're one of those, uh, Sherry, my wife, uh, watches the, the uh, comments and everything. So, and then she'll give us a list near the end of the show, and we will pray for you. And so you can just uh, put that on there. You don't have to. If you're embarrassed, or whatever, you don't have to get in any detail. You can just say, you know, Susie needs prayer, <laughs> and so oh, and, we'll, nice. and we'll pray for her. Uh, we've had a wonderful. This is we're going to wrap up our. Our series on from sinners to uh, sons, and it's really been a great series. It has. We've had uh, we've had tremendous comments. Uh, it's it's been very positive. Uh, some of them uh, we got some comments last week that they thought it, last week was the best lesson that we had taught, mm -hmm. and when you all so rudely interrupted us. We were talking about that maybe sometimes uh, I don't explain something well enough. If you feel that way, please, please um, make a comment or something, and and we will we will try to uh, uh, to explain that where you know best of my understanding to you because a lot of times, well, I think not a lot of times. I think everybody experiences. Uh, Times when they uh, will tell you something and they think you automatically understand that. And I was telling Susie, uh, I had wrote and, uh, and performed in a uh, uh, a play. It actually was on my family and my father, and, and it was really us in the ministry. And that was called The Gospel According to Kennison. And uh, one of the things I did is I, I wanted to find a director. I went through, or I actually interviewed several directors and I finally uh, found a uh, Jewish director uh, Greg Cohen that uh, that I asked to direct it because he had absolutely no clue of what I was talking about when I was talking about how I was raised in Pentecost or or how we believed in everything that was exactly what I wanted so that uh, he could nail me down to you know, you need to explain this because I don't know what you're talking about. And if I'm that way in our lessons, please, please make a comment and we will try to make it as clear as we possibly can. I watched something this week on Facebook, which I don't spend a lot of time on there. Usually I just uh, check the messages in the morning and that's it. And it was a gentleman that uh, I think he was speaking at a college commencement. I, don't, I never caught his name. And he was talking about actually his father. That was a third grade dropout, but he said he was the smartest, wisest person that he'd ever came across in his life. I better, Chris Kyer's going to get upset if I, I keep know. looking at you. 
And, uh, and I got to thinking about uh, my father and my father-in-law, and I started thinking about uh, other influences, but those two, my father and my, my father, uh, Reverend S.E. Kennison, Sam Kennison, and uh, my, uh, my, my father-in-law, Reverend J.R. McFadden, uh, had the biggest influences on my life. My father died uh, just before Sherry and I got married. I was 23, and uh, I called him the Rev, Reverend J.R. McFadden. We were, all re we were best friends before I ever dated his daughter. And so my father died, and it was like uh, Reverend McFadden just stepped right in and became my father. And what some of the things that they taught me was, is I remember my father really drilled into not only me, but my brothers. And, and I'm going to tell you something. They must have done a good job because uh, myself and my brothers all were, were successful in life. Uh, Reverend McFadden, his children, his daughter, and, and two sons were very successful in life. So they had to do something right. But the wisdom that they would give to us or gave to me, my father, the wisdom that he gave to me. And I got to be honest with you, I don't even know how far he went in school. He never, ever told me. I know it wasn't uh, very far. He picked cotton in Arkansas as a little boy and then had a very interesting life. He, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I should be telling this, but uh, he, he, one time he was impersonating a doctor in Detroit and working in a hospital. Wow. <laughs> and uh, his brother happened to come in there because he was sick and saw his uh, brother Sam in there. And he goes, what are you doing in here? My dad goes, uh, they think I'm a doctor. So, so don't blow it. And my Uncle Joe went, you either get out of here right now or I'm going to tell him you're no doctor. Anyhow, he did that and... Uh, he did several things, but a uh, very wise man that used to, uh, one of the things that he drilled in us in us boys was is being committed and determined. Whatever you do, commit to it. I remember one time he told me, you know, if you're a dishwasher, be the best dishwasher that, that they've ever seen, and then be determined. And then I went to... Uh, I went to Bible college. After I went to University of Illinois, I went to a Pinecrest Bible Academy in, in outside of Utica, New York. And my father would write me letters. Well, you know, when you're, in, when you're in college or you've been in college, you've got it all figured out. You got the world figured out. You've got it figured out how success works and everything. And my father used to write me letters about the things that... Uh, that he felt God was showing him. And I remember that uh, he would type like this. And he couldn't spell very well. I'm glad he's not here. He'd probably be very upset. But he couldn't spell very well. He didn't have a, uh, uh, like I said, he, he was, wasn't uh, real educated. But the wisdom that he would have. But he, he sent me, uh, would send me letters. And, and some of them are... Uh, are some of the things that I teach you today. Well, being in Bible college, uh, I'm waiting for Jesus to come. I'm, uh, you know, I'm getting ready for the tribulation. I'm doing all that stuff. And he would write me these letters. And I remember I went home on, on a break, and he asked me because I didn't know how to how to respond to these, to these letters. And I remember he asked me, said, uh, "Did you get, did you get my letters?" And I said, "Yeah, Dad, I, I got it." He goes, "What did you think?" And I remember uh, I told him, you know, you got to spend more time around other preachers. You can't, you can't just get off by yourself or you get into weird stuff. And I remember uh, he looked at me and he had that same smirk that my brother Sam had with that smile. And the only thing he said, which was typical of the wisdom that he would give us, is that he said, when the teacher, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And he was so right. I remember when I was a little boy, he used to, uh, whenever he went to bed or if he took a nap during the day, he would put the Bible underneath his head and would sleep with, I don't know why I'm looking at you so much today. I don't know why either. You're beautiful. That's <laughs> why it is. 
but he would sleep with a Bible underneath his head. Or if he took a nap, he'd have that. And one day I asked him, he said, Dad, why do you always have the Bible underneath your head? And he told me, he said, you know what? I'm a, I, didn't get, I don't have a lot of education. And so when I lay down and I sleep, I, I put the Bible underneath my head and I just want God to let some of that knowledge just just get into to my knowledge and into my my mind. And uh, that's the kind of person he was. I'm not going to dwell on it. I just wanted to uh, throw that out there because it so reminded me of this, of this man speaking at this commencement service. I want to pick up, what well, we're going to finish this uh, series today. The question, what is man, is probably best answered in the, my, I consider the most majestic statement of the entire Bible. And that's in Genesis 1, 27. And it says, God created man in his image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now, I want, I, want to, I want to go back over that again. I want you to really pay attention because we... You know, when we hear something so many times and all of us heard the story of the creation and but a lot of times when we hear it so many times, we already have a preconceived notion if I say something. So I wanna I wanna say it really slowly for you. God created man in his image, in God's image. And it goes on and says, In the image of God created he him. Other words, he wanted to really emphasize that. Male and female created he them. God created man in his own image, in his image. That's a big statement. Most Christians are not going to believe that. But they're it, as plain as can be. The image is man as God sees him. That's the image. When God looks at you, that's the image that he sees. Is that it's the man. That's what God sees in him. Is he sees himself in you. You were created in the image of God. Now, the likeness is what, how should I put this? It's what has to be worked out in man's own mind. And made manifest in his body and and in his affairs and the things he does. So the you're the image of God, but the likeness of God is what has to be worked out in your mind. And once you get that worked out in your mind, then you're the master of your affairs. You're a master of the situations around you. It is man's destiny. It is your destiny to produce a likeness of the image within you. That is your destiny. You're already made in the image of God. Now it's your destiny to, to uh, produce the likeness of God, which once again, I'm going to tell you, works in your mind. Well, you're going to see it here in just a few moments as we go on. This is exactly what Jesus did. He came into this world in the image of God, and then he found and he, oh, how can I put this? He worked out the likeness of God inside of him, which was the power that, that God gives to us. That that we we very seldom well, first we hardly believe that we just don't believe that we believe in begging and begging and begging and begging God we just have a hard time with uh, with you having power but you have actually with the power you've had you've created the world around you and you can change that world if that's not the world that that you feel that is your destiny you can change that. If you're in poverty, you can change that. If you're sick, you can change that. But you have to produce the likeness of God.
to change that. Most of us are, are looking for a man. We're looking for a man like the, the uh, man that was beside the pool. And he said, I've been laying here 38 years waiting for a man to throw me in the water. Well, that's been, that's been most people that I know of. We're waiting for somebody to pray the prayer of faith or, or to give us that touch. I have a brother that uh, he was trans, transformed uh, four years ago. He was born severely mentally handicapped. He was born legally blind. One eye, the nerve was totally dead. The other eye tested at 20 over 400, so he basically could see light. At 13, God sent an angel. On a Sunday morning, upstairs in the church that we lived in, <laughs> excuse me, and, uh, and the angel told Richard, according to Richard, that what the angel told him was, you can heal yourself. Richard put his hands on his eyes, and I'm sure he prayed, and he could see. Put his hands on his head, he said, and prayed. And he could retain knowledge, which he hadn't been able to do for 13 years. 13 years. At 13 years old, he could not count to 10. He could not spell his own name. He could not tie his shoes. He went to school, what they call an ungraded class, where they would try to teach him to eat and to dress himself. I think the reason that God did that, because we had preachers pray for him, every preacher that would come to town uh, would pray for, they would call him the retarded Kinnison kid. You know, back then that wasn't politically incorrect, but that's what they would call him. <coughs> and, uh, and so he got a miracle with no one praying for him. And I think the reason was is that God wanted him to be able to look to the likeness. He was already, Richard was in the image of God. When, when he was born, he was the image of God. And then he found that likeness to produce the power in his mind. And he ended up being the greatest evangelist that I have ever seen. And I believe me, I've seen just about all of them. Theologians have declared that that Jesus was God and became man. That's what I've heard my whole life. Jesus was God that became man. But Jesus knew that God already had become man. Back in Adam and Eve, he had already become man. He was in the image of God. Jesus knew that, that God had already become man when he first breathed the breath of his life into his own image and gave him life and that and that image became a living soul. I'm getting a little excited. I've got to calm down. You see, the very heart and core of the teachings of Jesus concerned not his divinity. In other words, it, it his teaching did not concern him being God. What it did was the divinity of man, the principle of divine sonship was what his teaching was all about. It was all about that you're sons of God. What I, what I do, you can do also. Either that or just take it out of the Bible. Just tear that page out of the Bible or all the other pages that he declares greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You're somebody. I want to tell you that this morning. You're somebody. You are the image of God. Now, you've been beat down. You've been pushed down. You've been walked on. You've been depressed. You've been, you been feel like that it's just the end of the world. Well, hear my voice this morning. You are the image of God. And I want to speak to the likeness of God to be produced in you that you don't have to look to Bill Kennison. You don't have to look to Joel Osteen. You don't have to look to Jimmy Swaggart. You can look at the image of God in you, and you can produce this likeness. 
And you can say, death, get away from me. Sickness, be gone. Poverty, be get, get out of my life. You can do that through the anointing of God. Oh man, I I I just get I get I get stirred up. I get she's getting stirred up too. <laughs> well, I have to because you do. <laughs> you know what? When I was uh, we held a tent revival. I think went all summer in Gallup, New Mexico, and our our crowd became. Uh, we ran big crowds, but it became where it was all Navajo American uh -huh. natives, and uh, so we had to have a translator. And it was really funny because translator tried to say exactly what you're saying, but they also do what you're doing. If you jump up and down, yeah. they jump up and down. And so it's like watching a mirror. That's how I feel sometimes with you. Well, I'm glad I get your impression correct. Well, thank you. You're doing a great job of it. You see, the very heart of the ministry of Jesus was devoting was devoted to preaching this principle. We made all this other stuff. Religion made all this other stuff. We made we made altar calls. We made healing lines. We made faith offerings. That wasn't what Jesus Jesus taught. His his teachings concerned the this principle of who you are. He did not want to No, I get so many things going through my mind. On the Mount of Transfiguration. He went up to the mountain and his disciples were stayed behind, but they could see him. And they were praying. And all of a sudden, Moses and Elijah shows up. And Jesus converses with them. Then when he comes down the mountain, the disciples were so pumped up and so excited that they said, we're going to build three temples right here. Doesn't that sound like a television preacher? We're going to build three of them. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And Jesus basically told them, no. No, I don't want, I'm not here for you to make a monument of me. Yet that's exactly what we've done on, on Sunday morning like this. You have all kinds of monuments that are having services this morning. And Jesus was trying to tell him, I don't want, I don't want a, a monument. I don't want to be a, a statue. I want you to understand my teachings so you can do what I do. Man, the humility, the humility that he had. He said that if you do this, and now this is scripture, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Nothing. I got a, uh, I got a comment, and uh, I'm taking it as positive. But either way, it, it really, I, I enjoy it anyhow. And he, uh, and I think it went best of my memory. It went something about uh, we have the power of Jesus. You are a heretic like none other. And so I'm taking that as very positive. But that's exactly what Jesus taught. He wasn't wanting you to. What well, I know, I'm gonna upset some of you. He wasn't wanting you to look to him for the answer. He was wanting you to look for the Christ in you for the answer. That's what the teaching was all about. That's what his teachings was all about. It wasn't to build a big following. He had thousands of people. Yet, after he would feed the hungry <coughs> or walk on the water or whatever he would do, he would take his 12 aside into a little place and the Bible said spoke more plainly unto them. We need to get this, this idea into our mind and, and being that man made in the image of, and likeness of God is just not a figure of speech. That is a reality. That is a potential that you're able to, you're able to get to. You see, when people sought to to stone Jesus for saying God was his father. Now we don't think anything about that. Everybody will say God's their father. Well, when Jesus said it, they wanted to stone him. And here was his reply that you find in, in Psalms 82. He quoted Psalms 82 when they were going to, they were going to stone him for saying that God was his father. 
And he quoted and said, I have said ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. Now he's telling this to people that want to kill him. Doesn't your scripture say that ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High? Then he added, I love when they add something, but he added, and the scripture cannot be broken. So you can change it, your interpretation of it, all you want, it cannot be broken. If the scripture says it, that's the way it is. Woo! I want to get up and shout, but nobody, <laughs> there's nobody to follow me around with the uh, no, camera. No, they get like half of you. Then well, I'd get in the middle of them and go, oh, my back. Oh, 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 oh Lord. <laughs> Anyhow, he was saying that I am only saying to myself what your law says of you. What I'm teaching and that some of you find so controversial is I'm only teaching you what you say is your beliefs. But yet when I make it so plain, you don't, you don't understand it. He was telling them, I don't set myself forth as an exception, but as an example of what the nature of man really is. Oh, I hope you all are getting this this morning. This is powerful. What Jesus did, and I'm going to say it over and over, what Jesus did, we can all do. You face some problems today? What Jesus did, we can all do. And it's fair to say that, that his is, is the normal standard for every individual and that every other expression is abnormal. So you want to know what normality is? Look at Jesus. What Jesus did is the normal standard. I think we have to right now, and we'll close with this, we have to define Christ. That has to be defined. Because of a lifelong conditioning, we think of, of Christ and Jesus as synonymous, as the same thing. The distinction is the hinge that the gospel beliefs is, is hung on. You need to get this really clear in your mind and in your thinking. When you hear people referring to when Christ was alive or when Christ walked the earth and different things like that, Christ is not a person. It is a principle. It is a principle. It's not a, it's not a person. When Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory, he isn't referring to Jesus. Jesus discovered the Christ principle within himself. You've got it. You need to go on a discovery and discover the Christ within you. He's there. It is there. Christ in you, the hope of glory. For it is that of you that is of God and is God being projected and into visibility as you. I hope, I hope this is understanding. Christ is your own spiritual unity with God. It is the key to your health, to your prosperity, to your life. That's, that's what it's all about. You see, Pontius Pilate and Jesus Christ, they were the same, they were the same thing, same as being beings, but they were miles apart regarding the manifestation. This has been, this, I've really enjoyed doing this, and uh, we're going to be back next Sunday. I have a few people I want to specifically <coughs> pray for, and then we're going to uh, pray for all of you. I have a good friend, Jack Herman, that went through surgery this week. <coughs> I think you're going to have to pray for me. <coughs> yes. <laughs> uh, also, the divine family, the entire family, is uh, sick with the flu, and we're going to pray for them. We're going to pray for Gigi and Richard. Richard is going through uh, quite a process, and uh, he needs a miracle. We're going to pray that God touches that body. And uh, Sherry has wrote down here, keep fighting the fight. You know, anytime you want to take this seat, <laughs> uh, you're welcome. Keep fighting the fight, and we're, we're still fighting the fights. Uh, next Sunday, we're going to start a series on the Beatitudes. Now, that I used to think that was boring. 
And then I started studying and I found out that uh, it isn't near what we've been taught. It is not near what we've been taught. And I was telling Susie before we came came uh, on camera and, and started doing the show that uh, this is the only, uh, historians believe that he actually had a manuscript of this of this message. It's the only record that we ever have of a complete sermon that Jesus did. And if you want to know, uh, a scientist or a philosopher or an engineer, if you really want to know what they believe, listen to their speeches to their peers. Well, this was to Jesus's peers. And next Sunday, uh, we're going to start on that. It's going to be fantastic. You're going to enjoy it. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity that you have given us on this Sunday morning and that you give us every Sunday morning to speak a little bit of truth. I ask that that you cause them to open their ears to hear, and their eyes to see, and their heart to receive the truth that will make them free. You said that if we will know the truth and understand the truth, it will make us free. Loose us. God, go from Alaska to Florida, from New York to California, to Illinois and Indiana and Oklahoma, and all the other places that we get responses from, and cause them to let this truth find a place in their heart. I ask that you heal them, you bless them, bring peace in their family, cause their emotional situation to, to be peaceful, and I'll give you all the praise. Amen. Well, Sue, that was great. It was great. We'll be back next Sunday. We love you. We'll see you next Sunday morning.